So how many of you, if I say let's science, know what I mean? No, no many? All right, all right, cool. So some people went to the party and still showed up first. <laughs> first thing in the morning, cool. Um, I am Mateo. Um, I work for Lullabot, uh, and I'm here with, with Wim. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he works for, for Acquia at the office of the city of Okta. And uh, we, we are here to talk about the API First initiative. I'm sure that you heard about it, or maybe you came here to find out. In any case, we're gonna talk about this. So what we'll say today is that uh, there has been some effort happening. I would say a lot of effort happening yep. uh, this, this past year, especially um, on the API initiative front. And uh, all of that has been directed from a vision and a set of goals that we have on what we think that the Drupal community should be headed in that front. And I stress that we think because uh, there needs to be a core conversation on this and uh, people should you know, just give their opinions. Um, so uh, there are some open challenges and um, we want to talk about all that, but what we value the most of this is the open discussion. So uh, we're gonna try to make a big effort for this to be a discussion and not an interview, like people going to the mic and asking to the presenters. When you go to the mic, please keep in mind that you're asking to the room and anyone can, can answer. Uh, so about what we want to accomplish, um, there was uh, a keynote, uh, I think it was a, a year ago, uh, where Tris said that um, he believed in, a first in first class web services in Drupal and top notch APIs out of the box uh, to truly become API first. Uh, by API first means to to have a focus on exposing your, your data via, via the API, and from there deriving um, other, other important systems, right? And the, the vision has been uh, to have all the data available uh, in, in, different, in different ways. Yep. Um, by the way, there's still seats available for those standing in the back, so if anybody can raise their hands who's, who still has a seat next to them, so please move forward so that there's room for more people. Um, so yeah, the, the division is basically Drupal uh, is, is great at structured content, it's great at storing data, managing data, and so on. And so it should be possible to get it out in any way that you might need or that you might prefer. So both restfully and non-restfully. Restfully in any format that you might want, custom formats even as well. Multiple flavors, by which I mean the, the HTTP purist approach that uh, the core REST API offers. Um, or as well the, the JSON API.org, so the JSON API spec uh, approach, which is uh, the module that uh, Matteo has worked on a lot, along with others. So those are both RESTful approaches, and there may be additional flavors uh, in the future. Um, but also in non-RESTful ways, because sometimes that is the, the, better, the better match, so via GraphQL, or even things like uh, via CouchDB for replication and offline first and so on. And all of that using any authentication mechanism. So th the point is, we want you to be able to use your data, access your data, manipulate your data in any way or form um, that matches your particular use case. Um, of course, we can't offer all of them right now in a fully stable, perfectly documented, perfectly tested way and so on, because it's a lot of work. But the intent is at least to get to that point where um, you can use any mechanism you want. So the goals are basically make Drupal 8's REST API usable, we achieved in, in, in making, making that uh, the case, so that is done. Making Drupal 8's REST API best in class, which is what we're working on nowadays, and uh, excellent documentation. So um, that is also something that is in progress because I think uh, those of you have, who have used it have noticed that the documentation isn't as awesome as it should be. Ideally, we would also have JSON API support. Uh, that is also in progress. UUID and revision support, because everything is currently ID based, which is not ideal for syncing and so on. Uh, revision support is also currently missing. That is something we would like to have, but isn't actively being worked on yet. Uh, GraphQL support, there is a contract module, but it's not uh, fully there yet. Could have CouchDB support, that's uh, something that is less frequently requested for now. 
wealth to support, but, uh, but more things as well. But for now, these are our high level goals, if you will. Why all of these? For REST API, the, the REST API in Drupal core, the reason is that it supports multiple formats. It's not tied to one particular serialization, one particular normalization. You can have whatever you want. So you can add your own if you want to. It supports any kind of resource, not just entities, which is also very valuable. Uh, and it is very configurable. Um, so you can customize it very precisely, precisely to match your needs. Then the other, the other one is JSON API. The goal is for this one to become stable in Drupal 8.3 contrib, so soon, uh, and eventually to end up in Drupal core. Uh, why JSON API? Because it is an opinionated spec. Um, so it is kind of the opposite of REST API in many ways. Because it is opinionated, it's possible to have better tooling, so libraries, uh, uh, frameworks that talk to it directly, and so on. Uh, precisely thanks to the more opinionated approach that it has, which leads to less bike shedding, more standardization. Therefore, you can have that better tooling available. Collection support is something that is natively available in JSON API. And for core REST, uh, the unfortunate thing is that you have to go and create a view with a REST export display so that you can access it. So it is possible to, get to access collections in a very precise and uh, curated way. But it does take that extra effort, whereas in JSON API, you can just use the URL query string to get just the um, subset of the collection that you want. It's not configurable JSON API, unlike the core REST API, but it's also an advantage because you don't have to go through the setup process anymore. So it just exposes any entity in Drupal core, and it just respects the entity access API. So it makes things a whole lot simpler by relying on other subsystems and le relying less on configuration which makes the, the getting started much easier. GraphQL, the goal is for it to become stable and contrib. It's, uh, it's similar to JSON API in many ways, but it's perhaps better suited for certain use cases, and it's certainly an expectation for, for example, uh, many React developers. So it's, it's really designed for a particular use case, um, and so it makes sense that we also support that for those people who prefer that approach. And excellent documentation. Uh, why stable and contrib? Because it's not just about manually written documentation about how to get started, how to set things up, and so on. It's also about automatically generated documentation that matches your, your data model, your, um, your formats that are supported, and so on, along with interactive examples. So being able to go into the documentation, drill down to node, blog node, and then do a get request, a patch request, and have interactive examples that show you how you can actually achieve those. So the starting is too painful right now, so docs with interactive examples are very important. So our current focus is REST API, making it best in class. What's missing there are translations, modifications of uh, configuration, so patching, deleting, and uh, creating um, configuration, both simple configuration, configuration entities. File uploads, that's a, a big one that is missing. Um, and so I, I believe personally that without these three things, at minimum, these three kind of bigger things that are missing, um, we can call ourselves best in class. And unfortunately, the reason that they're not done yet is because much of this is blocked on other subsystems in Drupal 8, not providing the right abstractions or the necessary metadata in order to achieve them. For example, for configuration, the lack of uh, uh, access control handlers for certain configuration, the lack of validation, and so on. JSON API, stable on A3 contrib and uh, then eventually moving to core. What is missing in JSON API mostly at this point because it is already an RC. Um, comprehensive test coverage like the one that we have in Drupal uh, cores REST. But also everything above, everything that is missing in the core REST API is also missing in JSON API simply because, again, the subsystems do not provide it yet. So we need to fix those things in the Drupal core subsystem so we can have it be working in the core REST API and then we can also make it work in the, the JSON API module. GraphQL, the goal there is to become stable and contrib. What is missing there currently is active development, unfortunately. So if people are interested in, in GraphQL or if they're enthusiastic about it, please uh, talk to the GraphQL maintainers and uh, get it moving forward again or more actively at least. Uh, and finally, excellent documentation. What is missing there, or what has been missing, is active development as well. Um, that is going to change in the coming weeks and months because we're going to focus on that more. Um, so expect big progress there. Uh, as well as standardization, because actually we do have several things already that do these things. So we have the REST API doc module, which is something from before the Drupal 8.0 release days even. 
with a proof of concept. It works, but it's not complete enough. The schemata module, which solves another subset of problems, the Doxon module, which uh, Matteo released uh, not too long ago, which is specifically for JSON API documentation. And then there's the Open API module. Like, there's lots of different approaches, and they all have some overlap. The goal is to bring it all together into one standardized approach that works for all the things, so that we can um, bring all the effort together and not duplicate effort. So what is next after all this? Short term or long term? Uh, who knows? It really depends on how many contributions we get. Uh, UUID and revision support. Uh, that's important for the syncing use case, for example. Um, the Relax Web Services contrib module currently does provide that, um, but only to, uh, it's not in core, and it, it's not it's, uh, comprehensively tested and so on, so it would be great to bring that at least partially into Drupal core. OAuth 2 support, so instead of just uh, cookie, so session cookie and uh, basic auth support in Drupal core, it would be great to have OAuth 2 authentication, because that is really the expectation that most people have. And CouchDB support for the offline first type of application, that is also provided by the Relaxed Web Services module in, Drupal, in, in Contrib. Um, but that also might be something we want to move to into Drupal core eventually, depending on how, how high demand is and so on. So with that, I'll hand the mic back to Matteo. So one of the things that I did in order to prepare this presentation was I went through all of the sessions that were accepted at a DrupalCon. There are lots of them. And I kind of tried to gather uh, the ones that, that were striking to me that were related to this stuff that we're talking about. To kind of, I, I had the impression that there was a very big need of this, or at least a very big interest on, on this topic. And it turns out that uh, we had uh, one training we had sessions in coding and development, two sessions there. We had two core conversations. We had a Drupal showcase. We had uh, two more in the front end space. Uh, a bunch of them, I think there count five of them in the horizon track. So in total, we have 12 sessions and one training. To me, that speaks volumes on why why are there are so many people in, in these kind of sessions. There are, the, the need is out there. Uh, my gut feeling tells me that uh, the multi-distribution channel is one of the biggest reasons why we want to get APIs. Uh, whatever the, the reason is, uh, we, I think that uh, as a community, we need to get there. It's, like, uh, it's a very important goal uh, because I believe that this is where the future of web applications um, and the CMS is. So how do we get there? Uh, by collaborating. So this, uh, this is a, a list of people. Uh, there's um, Wim here. Uh, he's awesome. And a part of that, <laughs> he is the initiative coordinator and the REST module sub-coordinator, and he's a collaborator in JSON API, and he does a lot of other stuff, like making sure that all the things core improves trickle down to things like JSON API and, and everything like that, and many other things that, uh, that I'm not listing here. Um, I'm not saying this just because I want to praise him or every, everyone in this slide. Uh, it's, it's not only about that. It is because when you go back home, like with the DrupalCon energy, uh, and you want to collaborate, if you want to do any of these things there, you can reach these people. Uh, you can reach me if you want to uh, do anything related to JSON API or uh, OAuth authentication or if you are interested in uh, creating automatic documentation. Uh, Daniel Wiener, uh, he's also very active on uh, the Drupal, uh, and in, in particular on JSON API and, and in REST. Uh, he knows all about it. Uh, then there is Ted over there. Uh, he's, he's done a lot of REST work. He's kind of leading the effort on the open API uh, effort that so yeah, the documentation. The documentation that, that we was mentioning um, that we are gonna start pushing forward to, to that direction. So thanks, Ted. Um, and there's this Damien, the serialization maintainer. Uh, the serialization module is kind of my 
one of my little triple fetish. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's great. And, and he is also a REST collaborator. There's so many people. I see Chris, uh, Chris there. Chris has done awesome work in, in JSON API. So if you have any desire to collaborate, uh, I believe that all of us are IRC people. Yeah, yeah. We just jump in Drupal Contribute or even Twitter or yeah. um, just reach and, and let's get this started. And don't be afraid to report issues, good or bad. Please report issues, 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 issues. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> gets kicked out, we can just redo the conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, so besides these people, there's still many more people. Uh, people who are actually just getting started in Drupal as well, so it is possible, to, absolutely, if you haven't done core contributions yet, um, to get started and help out with novice testing issues and so on. I see people being very successful in, in uh, helping out that way and getting familiar with how to help out with Drupal core things. So it doesn't need to be as daunting as it may otherwise seem. It can also be simpler. Um, I think that's what we wanted to say here. So please contact us. Please report issues. And so um, the current state. Do you want to take this one? Or? I, I think that what we want to, the, in the current state, we, we are at a place where core rest is in pretty good shape, yeah. I would say. Like uh, there are some things that uh, kind of from a practical standpoint, are difficult to achieve with core rest. There are some things that from a practical standpoint, they are very difficult to achieve without core rest. So using uh, other solutions like JSON API or GraphQL uh, is not exclusive, mu mutually exclusive with using a core rest in one, one way or, or another. Yeah, so I forgot to mention that, but basically core rest, it does allow you to do things that aren't entity related. And so it is kind of a, JSON API is kind of the sweet spot for everything related to entities, but then as soon as you want to do non-entity things or completely custom RPC style REST things, with REST things, um, then the REST module is a good fit. So core REST is in a good state and we're just maturing it further. And so for that we need, of course, your feedback on which things are getting in the way and so on. And of course also we, we are making a focus into getting a JSON, JSON API stable. And uh, I would say that it is stable. Uh, we may tag something. That we are kind of blocked in some of the core issues to uh, kind of solve the problems from the bottom up. Yep. And uh, we may not wait for that because uh, we have semantic releases. So when that happens, we just bump into version two and it's an easy upgrade. Uh, so that seems like a popular solution nowadays. And also, one of the things that uh, we wanted to highlight is that we need more of this. I don't know if uh, you are familiar with Waterwheel. Uh, it is a suite of uh, kind of companion libraries for client-side solutions or that built on top of uh, both Core REST and JSON API. Uh, there's one for JavaScript. There's one for iOS. Uh, this is great, but we need more. We need, uh, we need to get things like a starter app for React. Uh, we need to, to get, I don't know, there are many things that people are gonna want to do, uh, and we want the tooling that makes things very easy. Like, you want to get started, you don't get the uh, blue marine theme, no, not the blue marine, anyways, the, the default theme in Drupal, and you're just there. Kind of, uh, we want a good experience in getting a decoupled site or a decoupled application or a decoupled Alexa skill or 
any of the endless possibilities. So these kind of ideas are very useful. They, are, they may not be 100% Drupal related, but um, this is the whole point. I mean, this is the couple. There are two parts of this, right? Uh, yeah, and then some of the outstanding challenges that are like the so hopefully you got a pretty good, pretty good view now of where this where the what the status is of all things related to API first. Uh, so REST is in a good place, JSON API is in a good place. Lots of more thing, lots more things are in progress. Um, there are some things that are missing in core REST and in JSON API, but the vast majority is uh, in a good place. And then some of the more interesting remaining challenges are things like image styles, how to associate those with. Uh, with, a, for example, an article that has an image field, and then how do you associate image styles so that you can easily get at them without having to do crazy other requests or hard coding things. Uh, staying up to date, so things like, um, uh, what do you mean by this? <laughs> so so stay, staying up to date it would be like, uh, JSON API is very popular now. Okay. GraphQL is very popular now we can provide these uh, starter kits that I was talking about, uh, but then uh, Angular 17 comes out, right? <laughs> and that's uh, an easy joke. Um, <laughs> so we, we need to be able, sadly, we need to be able to adapt to an ever-changing ecosystem. Uh, we're doing a good job, I would say. Uh, we don't need to uh, write the front wave, but we need to be vigilant in not to stay behind, right? So that is an open challenge. Yep. And things like improving the DX further when you actually do use the REST API or JSON API, and things in particular then like uh, if you are patching an entity or posting an entity, you get a validation error, but it's currently not in the best of formats, so it's like you have to do some parsing kind of. Uh, that should be better, and there are some RFCs, some standardization things, but nothing is really, like there is no consensus on how to do this. Uh, things like field aliasing, so Drupal of course by default has that field underscore actual field name thing. The goal is there to avoid conflict, so when Drupal core adds a new base field to an entity type, which we've done recently with uh, the, the workflow initiative, so there is a field specifically to track the moderation status and so on. Um, that's why it's there, to avoid conflicts there with customly created fields, but it does get in the way because it, like, it feels very Drupal-y to have every single field prefixed with field underscore. So we kind of want to find a solution for that, but it's difficult to do so and so on. And at the same time, it sometimes is uh, at odds with backwards compatibility because yep. we want to provide good uh, error codes for, for your requests, uh, and if you try to save a node with an NID, it may cause a 500 error caused by the database library. And if we go and fix that and try to provide a, a 419 error code instead, which would be more appropriate, uh, we may be breaking backwards compatibility because our contract is the output of the API, so we cannot change it lightly. So those decisions uh, need to be taken seriously. So that is also an, an open challenge in improving the DX. Yeah, the, the, the vigilance for not breaking backwards compatibility is very difficult because that sort of thing is kind of an edge case, but then maybe some people's code is relying on that and they're detecting that 500 response. So if we fix the API, which is to do the right thing to send a 419, we actually break some people's app. So it's a, it's a slow process and, and we need to weigh every single thing very carefully, which is why those kinds of things take some time. Um, so yeah, this is not the, the full list of course, but you, can, you get a sense of what kinds of problems uh, still exist. And with that, I think uh, we're... And now there's the fun part. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I said that I didn't want this to feel like an interview. Uh, so when you have a question, you can use both mics, right? Um, just, just lying there. Uh, and when someone says something or asks a question to the room, uh, you can uh, participate by either uh, standing to the mic or by raising your hand. And if you do that, raise one finger to add something to the current topic and raise your whole hand if you want to switch to a different topic. So we can kind of keep the discussion organized. And if you do participate in the conversation. Uh, there is candy. I brought candy. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So clearly, Matteo is a really awesome guy here. So for those not here, Matteo is just laying all the candy and all the fruits on the table in front of us. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's hear it. Questions, frustrations, what works well, what doesn't? Hi, my name is Mariano. I worked with uh, Matteo like six months ago with the first version of uh, JSON API. And I would like to say that one thing that it's really helpful for, for them is try to contact them when you start a new project. Uh, for example, we make a newspaper using JSON API, the first alpha versions, and Matteo broke the API several times, but for a good reason. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that is it's, uh, really, really helpful for them because if you are using these modules, I contribute like seven patches and I stopped to contribute to that module because I didn't use it uh, anymore. But I think that kind of um, contributions make uh, like the, the ecosystem uh, bigger because yeah. uh, you can explain what are your use cases. Uh, and probably the, the person that is coding the module is not using in the way that you expect it will be used. So yeah, we're getting the real world experiences and right. the small things that we missed or the small oversights or the big oversights maybe, those are the ones we want to hear about. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Don't forget your candy. <laughs> hey, this is Peter. I uh, just want to try to make a connection to a couple other core conversations where people were very interested in having essentially a small core that could be really a very effective REST backend or application, you know, feeding an application and just want to throw it out to you and to the room, like what is the minimal set of things that really is Drupal core? Mm -hmm. Like if I wanted to build, you know, REST application and manipulate some entities and, uh, you know, have user accounts essentially, like yeah. what, what are the sole Drupal modules you would leave in core and what, what is extraneous to that goal? And maybe you guys can comment if you have any ideas or other people in the room could, could mention you know, node and user module and obviously the rest API module but and system module. What else what else would you need? <laughs> right. I, I think maybe you're asking should we have a distribution or an install profile that does this out of the box so that it's easier to get on board so that we don't need to say what the list of modules is. You can just download and install it so that sure. you have that list of modules. I, I, yeah, yes. and I think I'm also asking you if, if you have a sense already of like what is what is the minimal set of things that, you know, if you're gonna run a REST server that which are the yep. very fewest number of core models you could have enabled, and if you have an idea or someone else does. I totally agree with that idea, because I recently had, as I also told yesterday, I had a personal project where I was doing a REST um, backend with a JavaScript application, and getting the, the Drupal running and getting JavaScript running was very easy, but actually finding out which modules served my purpose was very, very difficult, and I had to spend a lot of time and a lot of frustration just getting a result, and I actually ended up writing all the REST services myself because I couldn't get anything that suited my needs just because of I hadn't found the JSON API or right. was that other module that could have done it. First of all, I'm very sorry. <laughs> 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 Second, uh, yes, we, we've been talking actually quite a bit with several people and it's been raised again and again that it would be great to have such a REST or API first starter distro or whatever the name would be. Uh, um, I think, yes, it's basically anything related to the entity system, all the different field modules so that you can do the rich data modeling that you currently can do, minus any of the UI modules. So I would think things like, well, BigPipe, for example, is completely irrelevant for REST responses, that sort of thing. If you want to add something, please come ahead. Um, so yeah, I agree that it could be much slimmer. Um, the, the one thing I would say is Drupal Core plus JSON API, for, because the vast majority is using entities. So. JSON API is a key module to make it easier to get started. So would it make sense then, since this is a core conversation, we have like minimal, we have standard, would it make sense to, all of these things are going into core at some point, right? Like JSON yeah. API could go into core. So it makes sense to have the install profile there too, right? I, so yeah. you have the API install profile, that's an out of the box, you just get the API. I very much agree, however, there is, um, 
like JSON API is not currently core. No, not currently. Yeah, I know, current, but but that, but that's that's a thing. We would have to have JSON API first in core in order to have such an install profile in core. Yeah. So maybe that is something we can do at a later point in time. I think it's better to for for now experiment with a distribution. Oh, outside for sure, core. for sure. I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah. bringing the distribution definitely, in definitely is something that we haven't ever had. Yes. Right. You you've always had standard. You've had minimal. You have testing. Yep. But bringing a distro in because it's only core modules sounds yep. like a powerful thing that it you is. can roll out of the box. Yep. However, there is one concern then with uh, with the, the stay up to date, the evolvability. Like for now, JSON API is popular, but maybe in two or three years it isn't anymore, and then we are stuck with maintaining this forever. <laughs> right. <So laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> yeah, and then Drupal 9 BC, everything must remain BC, so we cannot ever remove JSON API. Like, uh, or that's something that there there is like. Um it's a double side, right? Yeah. There are two, two sides on, on that coin. Uh, the first is that it's very difficult for a uh, contrib module to rely on JSON API. Ha have it, has it a, a as a dependency? It's harder if it's not in core, right? Um, and also to dock food and use those APIs in core, it is impossible if uh, JSON API is not in core. Uh, but at the same time, adding more and more stuff into into core, it goes against the principles of the initial question that, that Peter was saying. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's a weighing thing. And I think for now the answer is a distribution because uh, we can do without having to get all the things in core and then we can improve the experience to get started. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess we were even talking more radically, let's um, use Composer yeah. to build a version of core that is suitable for UI and a version that's suitable for API and split, you know, some a lot of the modules into their own repositories or something. So so we we really n have a core identified that is essential for all yep. functions and then add on core modules to build distributions that are useful for different things. Yes, I, I think we should explore all that. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Um, two things. Uh, since you just mentioned like keeping it in core and eating our own dog food. Is, is the plan still to eventually down the road start doing the admin interfaces as headless? I mean, big question mark. <laughs> like, yeah. who knows? Maybe yeah. if it happens, if, if that's how we, if we keep going in that direction, maybe not, maybe yes. Yeah. I don't think anybody really knows. My bets are in the no part. <laughs> <laughs> Triple ten, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Though, yeah. um, when you end after this huge effort, X months later, you've gained no feature at all. So, but uh, really except for instance of the, you know, maintainability and and all that. But yeah. from the user perspective, it's hard to. Yeah. And then uh, second question: I'm still confused at what the development workflow looks like this. So is it going to be more like REST WS or is it going to be more like RESTful? Because there's a, like two vastly different workflows. Both of the worlds, like the best of both approach. Okay. Uh, I would like to think, uh, uh, yeah, like there is a, the flavor of the zero configuration that REST WS had. Like you go, enable the module, and boom, everything's there, right? Uh, that was, that is something that compared to these Drupal 7 solutions uh, wasn't there for RESTful. Uh, you had to make more an explicit uh, design in, in RESTful, but at the same time, it has many, many of the features that you had in RESTful, like the ability of a consumer to uh, decide what data they want in the response and uh, built-in pagination, collections, et cetera. I think as long as we have that, as long as you can handcraft at times your, your endpoints, I think that, right. that's Right, and that's why I like the serialization module, because yeah. you can just write a normalizer. Yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Ted. I'm, uh, one of the maintainers of the open API module. And this is sort of like just a call to help. I'll probably be sprinting on it on uh, Friday. Tomorrow. It, yep, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and just if people, I, I've run into a lot of people at the con who know open API swagger outside 
of Drupal, um, who've used it on projects um, where they're maybe connecting to something that provides you with a Swagger output. But basically, it's a way for us to document our REST now, but hopefully JSON API endpoints um, through a standard format that we didn't invent. And uh, so, which allows us to take that format or to take that output and to use it in a lot of different tools. And a lot of, some of the really interesting tools are the ability to make boilerplate code in a lot of different languages, but also to make uh, human readable documentation. So a sub-module of the OpenAPI module is OpenAPI Docs, which uses the Swagger UI module to make documentation. Um, so that is a JavaScript library. I'm not a JavaScript programmer, so you call for help there. Um, it works now, but it probably could work better. And potentially, uh, women mentioned this, that the documentation would actually have like a try it now feature. So you'd say, you know, this is the node at node ID input for getting it, and you could actually fill everything out, hit try it now, and you would see what the output for a particular node is. Um, so I think it has a lot of potential to um, make Drupal easier for people who don't know Drupal. And I think, especially for the REST module now, um, using it, you really kind of have to have somebody who knows Drupal yeah. um, because you're going to get a lot of stuff back in a very Drupal-y format. And um, we can't really document the REST API in a handbook because it's never going to be true for any particular site. So I think it's important to have that documentation so that we need documentation. Like, everybody's API is different um, depending yeah. on what resources you have. And what so question, show of hands, who has tried to use REST documentation and so on in Drupal core, but has been confused, frustrated, or gotten stuck by it? OK, nope. OK, so about a dozen hands. Or how many people found it's good? Maybe it maybe works. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 yeah, one and a half person, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so Friday, if anybody's interested. Or contact me. Uh, Talk to me after the session. Yeah, cool. I, I have something to add to that. And I think that this is extremely important if we want to have this uh, starter kit apps. Because the probably, like Ted was saying, I'm not JavaScript developer. The people that are most skilled in starting these uh, starter kit apps are JavaScript developers, but they are maybe not. PHP or Drupal developers, so having sound documentation and easy to install Drupal profiles or um, or distributions will will really help on then getting getting productive. I think Dad wants to add something really quick to that. Yeah. So just because uh, there was a couple list of a couple modules that could do documentation, and we've talked to the REST API doc person. He's okay with moving stuff to the open API. So he has the thing on his project say, check out open API now. And uh, Mateo is the one doing Dachshund, and that's sort of a stop gap until we get something like that, right? And there's a module called the Schemata module, which both rely on that actually does a whole bunch of the heavy lifting for converting, normalizing our um, type data into the JSON schema format, which is again, something we didn't invent, which open API uses, but also could be used in other ways. In other words, lots of things are moving in the direction of standardizing, so that's great. So we need more people to help out, basically. Cool. Uh, hello. <coughs> hello, I'd just like to first of all say I, I am very excited about this, in this initiative. I was, didn't, I was not aware of it until I came to DrupalCon, this DrupalCon, but it resonated with me because I'm a big advocate of, like in web development, we have uh, web, uh, mobile first. You know, so I'm a big advocate of that. In web app, app, in application development, we have, I'm a big advocate of offline first. So this is just like the same thing, but API. Um, so also, I do believe that this is where the web is going. You know, consume your data in the most simplest form and then I'll put it however you need it. Um, with that, my question is, and I'll probably get laughed out of the room because <laughs> it's a very basic question. But, um, I doubt it. <laughs> but uh, in web programming, in web program, I mean, in programming languages, period, I'm uh, familiar with, with the concept of, um, uh, first class citizen, and up and on here, I know on one of your slides you were mentioning um, uh, on, the, on the API that you work on a best in class, and I'm just can you just define that a little bit for me because I'm not familiar. I don't know if it's the same no, thing it's, or what. It's yeah. basically just um, saying we have a REST API, but there are certain things missing. It, it doesn't match the best APIs known on the web. Like for example, I think many people. 
I regard the GitHub API as being a very solid one, very documented and so on. Basically make the REST API of Drupal core equally high quality. That's what, what the intent is. Ah, okay. It's not strictly defined at all. It's just like if people think this is a thing that is missing for Drupal core's REST API to be considered super high quality, like it's, it's an example for other communities and other software projects to look up to, if there's something missing, let us know and we'll add it to the top priorities list. And okay. basically that is, it's, it's a soft definition. Kind okay. Of. okay, thank you. Yep. Um, One of the things that you guys were talking about earlier was um, adding or changing the API to say enhance um, error reporting. And you're running into a concern of, hey, if we go ahead and change this, we may break backwards compatibility with other people. My question is, why not do URL versioning? It's a common thing anyone who has built or designed APIs has run into before. Is there, was there a conscious reason that that was abandoned and purposely you know, ignored? Does anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that type of thing is more breaking the internal APIs, not the API facing the user, but the API facing the other parts of Drupal from the database abstraction layer. And if we break that, there may be custom modules that other people are looking, okay, when I get a 500, this is how I'm gonna deal with it, but they won't know how to deal with that 412, or was it? 419. 419 unless they know ahead of time that that's coming. Okay. Also, we had a note in, this, in the slides about API versioning. We took it out, so hoping that no one will bring up this topic. <laughs> it, it is, uh, I mean, I cannot see a solution where we have API versioning without having data model versioning. And unfortunately for Drupal, that would mean to spin up a new site, because you, if you delete, uh, let's say, if you delete a field, you delete it for past nodes. Like, you delete it everywhere. You just have one database state at, at a time, and even revisions would uh, not be able to, to handle database, uh, data model changes, and not being able to do that would corner us into, okay, let's do versioning but only for minor releases, but that means that you have to be very careful and uh, hack, or not hack, but intervene into the, in, into the field definitions to uh, make sure that nothing gets marked as required. Because if you mark something as required, you're not deleting anything you are just uh, changing a checkbox, but you're breaking backwards compatibility that requires a major version change. Uh, and that, I mean, all that makes it incredibly complicated, uh, close to uh, impossible, I don't know, impossible question mark. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, um, API versioning is, I think, in, in the grand scheme of things, an unsolved problem. Nobody has actually solved this. You can do URL versioning, but it's also imperfect because yeah, you could still be overlooking things and so on. But there's sort of roughly three ways to, um, to, to need API versioning, to break backwards compatibility and therefore need a new API version. First is normalization changes, which is what we're seeing quite a bit in Drupal core right now. Like we're missing certain properties of certain fields or certain fields are simply missing from the uh, serialized output, adding those Great, we're fixing things, but in, at the same time we're breaking backwards compatibility, so we would need to issue a new uh, version. Another is error responses, if those are improved, the 500 versus 419 example. And suddenly my screensaver starts playing. Um, and then the third, so uh, first is uh, error responses, second is uh, um, normalization changes, and then there's data model changes, which indeed is like, you know, there's, there's no way to, to keep that uh, sane. So it's a, if, if you have magical ideas, to solve it automatically in the entire world, please come to us. You will be rich because the world will pay you a lot to, to have your solution, but uh, it's hard. This is not a magical solution, but um, <laughs> uh, Brian Hirsch, Mass.gov, thank you guys so much for working on this. Uh, Apogee advocates a version of pragmatic REST where you put the version as a prefix right before the resource in the URL. 
And to me, that seems like a really sort of convenient, easy to understand solution. And I've imagined that versioning data in Drupal, you know, we would just have a prefix before the resource. Uh, and it hadn't occurred to me that it's like so deeply complicated. Like, what's the, what is the big, what is the big hangup? Why is it so complicated? Because, for example, like uh, Matteo was explaining, if you add a new required field, like how can you keep both working? Because the old API version, like v0 slash node, needs to continue to work the same way. But it, there is actually a new required field, so the fundamentals have changed, which means that posting new data to it cannot be working in a correct way because there is a new required field. So anything posted to it must have that required field. And only version one is supposed to um, throw a validation error, version zero is not. How do you reconcile those two? Like that's impossible. Same for removing fields. The only way that you can sanely keep your data models the same and not need complex uh, API versioning is if you only ever add new optional fields or remove optional fields. And that's basically the approach that GraphQL and the likes are taking. That way it is solvable, but then we would need to somehow limit that in the field UI in Drupal, which means that if you would have enabled the REST module or the JSON API module at some point before uh, the time when you are still making data model changes, we would need to block you ma from making such changes because doing so would break the data model. So basically the only way we can fix that is by disallowing making data model changes. Do we want to do that? It's something that we could use as a potential partial solution, but that is where things get so very tricky. So one quick follow up, forgive me for being overly simplistic here, but I'd love to know why this wouldn't work. Uh, I've imagined that you need to support two versions. So you know you, you, you don't break the previous version, but all the previous versions can be broken. So let's say I've got version one of some node type, and then I come out with version two. So isn't it, uh, it's basically you need a migration, you, know, you, you need to basically roll out a migration script when version two comes out, but hopefully you can't create any more of the version ones. You're only accepting new version twos. And then later when they invent version three, version one is deprecated and not available. You can do that on your, like if you control all the clients, then you can do that. But if it's an API that is available to other application developers, there is no way to do that. But yes, if you control your clients, then yes, you can definitely do that. Uh, but it's just up, not something we can assume in Drupal core, so we cannot solve it in an automatic way for everyone, which is why for now we're not tackling that problem. Okay, thanks. I mean, one possible solution, and this maybe could be done in contrib, is if you had some sort of hash of the current state of the data model, and you did something like version one is, you know, version one, this is the API for version one, that's the data model, and you send along with the request, I'm sending with version one, the data model changes, now it's version two, you have to send that along. If you send version one, we could at least tell you that, hey, you are dealing with the old API and it doesn't work. Because right now, if um, we have no versioning and the data model changes, no client would ever know that. And they would make requests, maybe sometimes it would work, maybe sometimes it wouldn't, depending on whether they add a new required field. So it seems like almost the best we could do in contrib, it would be to say, I'm at least going to tell you what I think the version is, and the, the responses would tell me, no it's not, you can't do anything, which is not great. I don't even know if that's worth it, but I seem like that could maybe be possible. I would like to say that we could talk about this a lot. And I, I invite anyone that wants to talk about this uh, to, to come to the Lullabot booth and probably to the Acquia booth, sit there and talk about it, like for the rest of the day, probably. <laughs> um, over the week, uh, but I, I'd like to move on to new topics, if you don't mind. Cool, I'll start a new topic then. Um, so first of all, thank you guys, just everyone involved with this. Um, having done some ha completely decoupled headless sites already, I don't even want to think about what it would have took to do in Drupal 7, so thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to add, seeing the revision and UUID support um, being one of the next phases, um, is kind of temporary states or composite entity states um, with like say previewing content. And that might be a separate concern from this. That might mean maybe changing how previewed content works. But when you're editing things in one place and then you have something that needs to be able to load that state to preview and display that, 
um, is kind of a challenging thing right now. Yeah, I, I think the answer is, um, I think you for, for preview you don't necessarily need UUID. I think the key thing that you're missing right now is uh, revision support uh, because mm -hmm. you want to be able to show or access a revision that is not the current one. You could actually write a, a custom REST resource mm -hmm. very easily that does exactly that. So it is achievable in that way. But I think the thing that will make it much easier is uh, once the workflow initiative matures a bit further, mm -hmm. where the content moderation module and the workflows module are actually stable. Because once those are there, we can actually come up with a standardized approach that provides an answer to this. Yep. So I think we're, we're definitely heading in, a, in the direction that it becomes very possible. Um, and it, it's very workaroundable for now. Uh, yeah. In very limited, with very that's limited what work. That's we're doing but right now. Yeah. So, cool. awesome. One of the things with preview is that it sometimes means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I would like to uh, do things like in Drupal 7 SPS did to preview my content, like be able to put some stuff in draft mode and schedule it to publish later and go to my site and say, okay, view my site as one week from today, right? That would be preview. And for that, working with revisions uh, would be just not trivial because it's not just the, the entity that you're working on, right? It's everything that relates to that entity needs to uh, kind of follow the same, uh, the same revision state timeline or whatever. So it's very tricky. It's mm -hmm. nothing uh, to be dismissed and um, it's possible. I mean, I worked for a client that wanted that and we were able to do it uh, by, uh, like I said, using SPS. And uh, yeah, we're not there yet. I would say preview is definitely the first step. Yeah, and, I, and that's exactly what we're doing right now is we're instead using draft revisions and loading those in and previewing that way. And maybe, I'm not sure honestly how preview works currently, but maybe it is making it more dependent on looking at a draft state rather than I think right now it's more of a temp store, but I might be wrong. So you're cur you have implemented a small custom REST resource to yeah, access. Uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep, cool. cool. Yeah, if you want to, what you could do as a, because there are several modules in the, in the REST realm, if you will, that are providing a certain niche that isn't currently standardized in Drupal core. So I would encourage you to publish a module that does exactly what you have right now mm -hmm. and makes it available for others to use to contribute to, to help expand. And maybe it is something that leads or informs, leads to a solution in core and informs the solution in core so that it's better. Sure. So helping, well, standardizing amongst each other in contrib on certain edge cases that aren't in core yet is a very valuable thing to do as well. It doesn't need to be an enormous thing. It can be very small. Sure, yeah, thank you guys. I just wanted to, as we're coming to the end, circle back to what Peter was talking about at the beginning. Um, you know, as a open source developed piece of software, uh, we've been having this conversation about the role of core versus what, what's consumed and so forth for some time. And there's, no, there's been no real reason for us to re-architect sort of how we are, because it's been working. But what you're doing feels like to me is giving us a reason to consider uh, in the direction that Peter was suggesting, uh, going eventually maybe Drupal 9 or 10 or whatever it is in, in an architecture that's more in, a, in, a, in the philosophy of symphony, uh, where there, there were components that are more loosely coupled, so you can assemble what it is that you need to give the, con the consumer what it needs. Uh, and uh, that sort of leads us back to where we were, we've been in the conversation maybe five years ago, but we didn't have a reason to do it. But what you guys are doing, it feels to me like it's giving us a reason to reconsider the architecture uh, to be more loosely coupled. Yep, could be a logical foundation for the greater Drupal, if you right. will. Right, yeah, yep. exactly. And then yep. we're consuming our own MP APIs internally, not just making APIs for external systems to, to yep. consume. But that's a lot of work, right? It is a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. Rewriting but, all of Drupal to use all of the APIs, but, that's... Uh, but we're, we wouldn't do that just yeah. to do it because it sounds cool. Yeah. Uh, we would do it because we had a reason to do it. And it feels like to me that, you, that what you're doing is starting to give us a reason to do that. That, that almost basically stole my question, which was, which was uh, maybe to put it in a more focused way. You know, usually when people talk about API first across uh, across the whole web world, 
but th that usually means that you're going to con you, you're consuming your own APIs, right? You're building all your own stuff on the same API you've exposed to everybody else. So my question was around, like, I know it's a long-term vision to do enough re-architecting that we would get to that world inside of Drupal, <laughs> but uh, where do you see, like, what, uh, and clearly the, f the shared API that you would share, it doesn't look exactly like JSON API or, or GraphQL or whatever. It's something a little lower than that, right? You don't want to go through all the serialization. You don't need HTTP, but there's some, semantic primitive there, right, for like reading and writing of data going through, that still goes through the, the auth system, right, like where do you see, like, is there, a, is there a kernel of that already? Is it something like, is it, the, is it the entity API? Is there something like that that becomes like one much more narrow API surface that everything else can build on? So you're asking basically the, the way that Drupal, the monolith, if you will, currently works, how it is interacting with it, uh, and whether we can change that? That's I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, like if, you, if you imagine that you got to do all the work that would give you a much more decoupable architecture where everything, where Drupal itself is consuming data through like a, a, a one fairly narrow set of APIs for reading and writing all of its data. Uh, is the does the kernel of that already exist? Is it something that yeah. you know, like, is it something that the entity API, for example, could become? Yep. Or is that just not the right place, and it would actually look some at its be at some different layer? Yeah, I think it's a combination of well, entity API is kind of the the surface level thing, but entity API builds upon several other things. The key thing here being the typed data API, which is basically a massive schema of describing all of the the different levels, so an entity has fields, a field has properties and so on, and describing all those relationships between the types of each, that is how we are able to do GraphQL, mm -hmm. uh, that is how we are able to do REST, how we are able to do JSON API, right. because all of those extract their metadata, their, their foundation, their schema from that information, so I think we have that. I think another part would be the access API, at least to some degree, because you need access. The entity API also has validation constraints, it uses the Symfony constraint system, which has certain problems, but overall it works. Um, so I think those indeed are like Entity API plus the things that it builds upon, minus some of the things that it integrates with, like for example, the render system, which mm -hmm. probably like you're not wanting to render HTML necessarily for all of this in the world that you're describing. Yeah, exactly. So and I think removing those bits, the, the HTML yeah. coupled bits kind of, that, and then keeping the rest, yes. Yeah, exactly, so, so it sounds like, uh, like the core of it is there. It's just a question yeah. of finding all the threads that don't go through those paths where there's other couplings and, and slowly yep. snipping those threads. And, and enriching the, the things that we do have because sometimes yeah. we still have certain pieces of logic that actually belong in some sort of metadata at a lower level, we have that in forms, for example. Mm -hmm. And so removing it from there and embedding it in a way that it can be reused by forms, but also JSON API REST and right, whatever yeah. else. Nice, yeah, yep. thank you. I, I would like to add to the people looking at the video at home, you probably want to add the couples from inside out. Uh, in in the in the queue later because we had a conversation that was kind of on the lines of that topic and it was uh, it was a very interesting conversation yeah uh, hi my name is Laure my question relates to the same but it's uh, more about from the perspective of contributed modules like how do we make sure that all of our contributed modules works I API first uh, as well especially given that um, the API spectrum is a little bit uh, fragmented, given that we have multiple different, like uh, you need to su support RESTful, JSON API, and, Cra and GraphQL is like the even yet different one. Yep. Are, are you mostly asking modules that are adding new kinds of structured content, so field types and so on, or are you asking modules yes, that provide functionality? Like something like panels is going to be in core, but something, something like panels or maybe web form or, yeah basically modules like that, not, not modules like uh, Big Pipe or Quick yeah. Edit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that, um, so one of the things we're seeing in the current serialization or normalization gaps that we have in, in uh, the core REST uh, module as well as JSON API because it affects JSON API as well, um, is that certain fields aren't actually output, even though it is in type data, so it, the schema is kind of there, but then certain bits of it are, are ill-defined or not defined or cause it to not work. We have particularly problems with computed fields. So fixing those gaps um, to, to make, ev make sure that every single thing in type data has a way to be mapped out of PHP slash database storage land into normalized JSON or normalized XML or normalized whatever land, I think that is um, 
one key f thing that we still need to do to, to make sure that every single thing that is in type data can be exposed. And then the other thing is that those modules, that's the thing that the modules have to do, the contract modules, is to ensure that they're not doing things in, in hacky ways or are, are altering output or something like that, but are instead using type data and are specifically defining the schema, the structure of their data correctly and completely, including references to other related content like metadata, such as, such as, such as for example, an image field should have the relation with image style URLs, um, that sort of thing. If all that information is there, if all that is described, then it can be surfaced automatically in REST API, in GraphQL, and so on. So think of type data structure uh, definitions. Yeah, it was also, um, yeah, so that was very technical answer, like. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I was also, yeah, so, it was a nice explanation of the technical side, but there's also the whole ecosystem side of this. Like, how do we make sure that everything in our e ecosystem has been thought out in a way that it can be uh, consumed uh, in API-first approach? I mean, I don't, I don't even know if we do this, but uh, I mean, some stuff maybe could be better documentation in the code itself. Like, I don't know if like the entity form, which extends form base, but for entities, like in the submit valid, in the validation, do we put a note there that said, don't put entity validation in your form submit, put it in the actual entity handler, stuff like that maybe would surface it to, um, or to explain the difference there. Because we have a bunch of stuff in, um, a bunch of validation in forms and presumably config does too, which could live with the entity. And if developers don't know that, kind of stuff and how would they know if they're not sort of deeply embedded in it, then sort of you're making something that if you, if it wasn't any of your exposing via REST, that validation is just not gonna happen. But it would, wouldn't be too hard to make it happen, it's just I don't think a lot of contrib developers would know that. I, I think another part of, of the solution could be um, test coverage uh, in the sense that uh, Drupal Core, or for Core REST, part of the reason that we are calling it stable and maturing, and f maturing further now is that we have comprehensive test coverage. So every single entity type, well, at the moment something like 80%, but all the key ones uh, do have full test coverage. The more esoteric ones, not necessarily yet, but that's being worked on. Um, but what we're doing in, in that test coverage is you have to define very little extra code um, you can just subclass something and then you are exercising an entity in all of the possible ways. So get, patch, post, delete, exercising validation, exercising edge cases and so on. And one thing that is currently only partially tested is validation and the, the completeness of the normalization. We could automate more of that so that uh, as soon as you have an entity type and you add another fields type to it, for example, then you have suddenly a test that is failing because you don't have the validation constraints um, and because you forgot about that in your contract module. So I think part of the answer can be that Core provides test coverage for all entity types that works automatically and that then fails as soon as you have a contract module that adds something that is not doing things the right way. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, cool. Also, um, in a maybe less technical way, I would say that when we go API first, we need to clearly define what we consider the backend part of Drupal and what is the presentational part of Drupal. Because we still want to support both, right? Uh, and having that line, well, for instance, the layout uh, module would fall maybe in the presentation part, right? because you don't control the layout for all the possible consumers. Like, uh, does it even make sense to have the concept of layout for an Amazon Echo application, 